Excellent. Hi, everyone. Welcome to our third session today. We have, um, I'm Michelle Arnold, and I'm part of the Empowering Teaching Excellence Office here at Utah State University. And I'm excited to present Serena Hicks from Boise State University. And she's going to be presenting on grading practices that measure and support learning. So I'm going to pass right off to you, Serena, and let me know if you need anything. Awesome. Thank you. Um, it, I'm, I'm happy to see all of your interesting faces and names. Um, I know that it's a weird day. We're probably doing lots of, any, lots of things. We're not sitting with coffee in a conference hall, <laughs> chatting with our friends like we usually are. But if you feel comfortable being on camera, um, please, please feel free to be on camera. I don't, I don't care if you're eating or drinking. I don't care where your cat is. My 25 pound Australian shepherd has decided that she is a cat. Um, and she's usually sitting on my desk now. So um, I, I welcome seeing your faces. I'm not gonna share my screen because then I can't see all of you. So you'll notice um, in the chat that I, I posted the slide deck that I'm gonna work from. That's going to be our, our space to work with today. Um, and I'm finding everyone has a different preference, but I'm finding that, that my preference is, I like to kind of go back and forth between looking at faces and, and looking at the slide deck um, rather than forcing you to look at exactly what I'm looking at. I don't know if you're like me, but people share their screen with me. And then I start scrolling on my computer thinking that I can look at their documents and it gets distracting. So um, we're going to jump in because our, our time is short. I have a plan. I have things that I want to share with you, but this is, this is not my time. This is your time. So if you think of things, um, there are a couple places where you can put ideas as we're working. If you scroll down, I see that you are all getting into the slide deck. So yay, the sharing worked. If you scroll down to slide 16, there's a parking lot. And it's a place where you can just sort of not have to go out to a different space, um, maybe a sticky note, but you can stay right here in the slide deck if you're thinking of questions or wonderings, or you just have an idea and you wanna capture it. This is a completely shareable slide deck. Um, you'll you'll have access to it. You know, you can make a copy of it, whatever, whatever works. I know um, Michelle is going to provide the resource, but put it in that parking lot. And then please also interrupt me either just by unmuting or, or in the chat um, and, and we'll just sort of navigate. So please don't feel like you can't interrupt and ask a question. Again, I have a mission, but the mission is to fulfill the needs that you have for learning. So here we go. Um, I want to share with you today some some ideas that I'm moving from my practice in teacher preparation into higher education. And I wanna just be kind of transparent about that space that I'm in. Um, I teach in the College of Education at Boise State University, but I also moonlight in their Center for Teaching and Learning. So I come from uh, secondary education. I was an English language arts teacher in middle school for a real long time, um, and then did professional development and, and hopped over, got my PhD, hopped over to higher education. So I work with pedagogy and assessment practices in teacher preparation when I'm teaching teachers to teach. But because I moonlight in the CTL, um, I'm also doing some of those same parallel practices with faculty. So working with faculty around the principles of pedagogy and, and practices. So when, when I'm talking, my head kind of moves back and forth between those spaces um, because the, the research in, in K-12, um, there's a little delay before that pedagogy hits higher education. And one of my missions is to bridge that so that um, the, the pedagogy that we're sharing with our students and facilitating <clears throat> is of high rigor um, and the best practice coming out of education. So. That's where we're going. Um, today's outcomes on slide two, I just have two of them because our time got shortened a little bit. Um, I want you to understand how success criteria and proficiency scales streamline grading. Um, and we'll define success criteria and proficiency scales if those are new to you. And I wanna give you a very specific tool to also explore and play with called the single point rubric. Um, you may have heard these things, these may be new things, but these are the three words that we're gonna we're gonna focus on today um, to give you an idea what it is, and then to show you some examples of what each of those things are, um, to help you think about how to use it in your classroom. And then I'm gonna share some specific tools. So you can like go to lunch and be able to play around with a single point rubric kind of just like that. Um, I wanna start with the difference between a scale and a rubric because we use the rubric more often um, then, then we use the scale. The proficiency scale is a little bit 
new language for us. So I'm gonna make the assumption based on the scholarship around these two, um, this is how we're gonna define the two in, in our session and moving forward. Um, a rubric often uses deficit language. It often points out what a student um, didn't do or hasn't yet done. We use words like, you know, doesn't have, or this work is missing. Um, we use that deficit language. A scale, and I'm gonna show you some examples of some, um, use, use growth mindset language. A rubric is often subjective. Um, words like clearly, the student clearly, this work mostly, it often does. Um, it's, um, well, concise, I guess, isn't subjective, um, but oftentimes in rubrics, we use those adjectives that, that are subjective based on our expertise rather than based on student understanding of success. Um, oftentimes a rubric will also label learning rather than describe the learning. Um, and one of the things we're gonna talk about today just a little bit is that oftentimes a rubric will include categories that aren't aligned to the learning outcome, okay? For example, and I know I'm stirring the pot with all of this, um, and that's okay. Um, I get to stir the pot and then leave and let you talk about it after after we go. Um, a, a rubric oftentimes will hold students accountable for for something that is ancillary to the learning. Twelve point font, double spaced, in pen, in a table, on time. Right. And I'm not saying those things don't matter, and we'll come back to that. Um, but oftentimes a, a rubric can be distracting to the student because they fixate on, on items that they have or have not done that, that aren't aligned to what the learning outcome is, to what you said you want them to learn and do. And we hold them oftentimes accountable for, for behaviors, right? Like what it looks like and, and how it's laid out. And is it, I just read on the Higher Education Learning Collective, this Facebook group I'm part of, there was like, 500 comments on whether students should be using MLA or APA. And I'm like, friends, why aren't you talking about what students should be learning? Why are we focusing on what they do rather than what they know? And that's the biggest difference here. I have to grab something because it has my notes on it. That's the biggest difference about what we're talking about here is the difference between what matters, um, which lots of things matter, and, and, and what counts. Um, and looking at thinking about grades rather than learning. Um, and sometimes that's the language between rubrics and scales is that rubrics focus on what a student does and how the grade comes out rather than the learning. I don't know about y'all, <laughs> but I spend a whole lot of time thinking about what grade should I give this student based on what I'm seeing here rather than what response do I give the student based on what they've learned. And that's often the difference between a rubric and a scale. So with those assumptions, I wanna give you a really clear definition of proficiency scale on slide four. And I'm gonna shut up for just one second and let you glance at those three bullet points. When we talk about proficiency scales, the learning outcome becomes privileged. Everything becomes about what the success criteria is, what it looks like to be successful against a learning outcome and defining where a student is on, on that learning progression. And I know that, that we have formative feedbacks that we give feedback during a learning cycle and we have summative feedback that we often attach to grades at the end of a learning cycle but a proficiency scale can can be used for either purpose because the success criteria never changes when you have a learning outcome in your courses you you don't change what success looks like we have a learning outcome we describe what success looks like and then a proficiency scale Let's us just look at proficiency. If I need my student to accomplish this task and have this understanding and have this skill, where are they on a continuum of learning up to that point? So it becomes, again, the focus being on where a student is in the movement of learning rather than, well, they're here, I'm going to give them the, this grade. So it privileges the outcome of the learning target um, rather than a nu numerical or, or a percentage grade. Um, my favorite thing about it, which is also the most messy thing about it, is that it forms the basis of transparent instruction and assessment. We have to tell students before we even begin instruction what success looks like. We have to know. 
right? We, we don't teach and then decide how to write the test and then we give the test. We decide what's the learning outcome, what does success look like that creates our scale and then, and then we, we teach to that outcome. So we have to be really clear and really honest and really transparent up front what success looks like. But here's the beauty of it. Once we've decided that and we decide that in advance, we don't have to make decisions about what grade to give a student because what we're doing is communicating where they are in the learning continuum to that target. So again, it's less, I know we have to assign grades and that's probably a whole other session, but I could tell you how to transfer all this to grades. Um, we, we have to eventually give a grade, but we want the focus to be on the learning and a scale will privilege that. So let me show you what one looks like. Um, this one, it is not content that any of us teach. And I, I did that on purpose because I want you to focus on the process instead of on the content. So here's an example of a proficiency scale. A proficiency scale describes what success looks like. I'm on slide five based on my learning outcome. So my learning outcome is I can walk my dog and I have to decide as an, instruct, as an instructor, what does that look like? I have to paint the picture really clearly for my students so that they can work toward that clear target and so that they can plan for it and become successful and we can have the language of success. So that pink box is proficient and that's where I start. When I write a learning outcome, I then immediately write the success criteria and, and list out what is proficient. And this uses um, student language. So an, an I can statement. You could also say the student could um, or the student can. Um, I like to transfer agency to my students. So I like to use um, the I can statements. I'm gonna let you look at that for just a moment. And in the next slide, slide six, I have some sticky notes over to the side um, that you can drag and drop and then double click into and, and type into. And for just a minute, I want you to read that proficiency scale example and, and type into those sticky notes. What, what are you noticing? What are you wondering? Less about the dog and more about the scale. I don't have enough sticky notes. Please copy, paste, make it, or create your own. I'm sorry if I fell short on those numbers. Be sure to glance at the other ones after you've written one, see if you're finding some patterns or if you have questions. <laughs> I love this. You started with statements and are ending with questions. Now you're like, oh, wait a minute. That's awesome.
Oh my gosh. I love the question about the chipmunk. Was there a chipmunk? Where did my chipmunk question go? Squirrel. What if there's a squirrel on the way to the park and the dog runs off? <laughs> okay, um, we're gonna leave some of those to float because some of them might be answered and some other things that we talk about, but I, I wanna address a couple in particular. Um, someone said, and I won't call you out, anonymous mouse, <laughs> that you can say who you are. Well, what if there's something that a student is doing that's not on the scale? What if there's a squirrel and the dog pulls and the leash goes off and right? What, what if there's something that's happening in the student work that, that isn't in the rubric? Um, I love that question. And part of me goes, I don't know. But then part of me does know. Um, wow, what good feedback for an instructor. If it's an outlier, it's something interesting to talk with the students about that there's something happening that, that's, a, that's an outlier. Um, but if I'm starting to get a whole lot of um, students asking me, I, I don't know how long to walk the dog. I don't know, I don't know either, I don't know, I don't know. Yeah, that's a good question. Then I need to come back to my own practice and notice if there's a proficiency or there's a practice or there's a skill or a knowledge that's either inherent in the learning target or a prerequisite to the learning target that I missed as an instructor. I, I love that feedback. I love that question because it turns me back to my own instruction. Um, a couple of people said, wow, I like this because it breaks something that could be kind of long and confusing into parts. There's these categories and I can see the movement in each of those categories. So it might be that I need another category. It might be that there's prerequisite knowledge that the student needs um, for me to fill a gap so that they have that information moving forward. Ah, good, good questions. I wanna pause here for, for just a moment. Um, and see if anyone wants to call out something for me to put in my head to come back to, because I wanna go forward and then we'll come back. I love this. Yep. How does it translate into a grade? Remind me, I'll come back to that. If I tell you now, you'll we'll be off on a rabbit trail that's not on the rubric either. Okay, I'm gonna go forward on to, to slide seven for just a minute, which we 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 kind of already talked about. Well, I talked about. Um I I love that scales and success criteria streamline learning because we already talked about this, D differentiates between what matters and what counts. Lots of things can matter, but it doesn't mean they, they necessarily need to count in a grade-based world. Um, you all noticed that it makes the progression clear, right? You saw that in these examples, and you also pointed all of this out in the previous slide that describes what a student will know and be able to do when their work is proficient. So there's no mystery testing. There's no, what am I going to be asked to be accountable for? Um, we communicate that up front. We even communicate up front what, what it looks like to move through those progressions so that a student can see themselves in the learning progress, keeping in mind that we can use a scale in both a formative and a summative setting. In fact, I really do recommend it because a student can use it formatively to grow and then summatively to understand the very clear expectations of their work. If I look at slide eight, um, I wanna show you what this can then turn into. Okay, so one takeaway is that the learning outcomes can be broken down and, and written into proficiency scales. And if you're gonna write a proficiency scale, you must begin with proficient because we always start with success and then we, we work back based on your discipline, what that looks like as it develops and it emerges. So start with the pink, but it could also turn into a single point rubric. And this is my new favorite thing. It still provides proficiency for the students, I'm on slide eight now. It opens up an opportunity for feedback if you're in a feedback cycle, but it really decreases grading time. And I need that really big time right now. So I'm gonna show you an example of a one point rubric. I'm gonna show you one that's been used. Um, and then we're gonna talk about that one as well. Um, a one point rubric takes the success criteria. So if you um, hop back to slide five and you look at the pink box, we determined what does proficiency look like on this learning outcome? What does it look like to be able to walk my dog? That is also the success criteria because proficiency is where a student has been successful. So I simply take that proficiency and popping back down to slide nine, I put it in the middle. I can walk my dog. What does that look like? 
these are my proficiencies. I literally copy and paste it and, and I have my rubric. Now I can use this for myself. I can use this with students. I can ask students to use it with each other. I can ask students to use it for their own self assessment and reflection. Um, but I can now give areas for improvement, which define the gap between where a student work is and where proficiency is. And I can do it categorically so that there's no confusion. I'm clear about what's gonna count. And I point out the gap between where I need a student to be that's proficient and their areas for improvement. But I can also talk about evidence of exceeding so that I can let a student know you have hit this target and here's what you're doing in this category that exceeds that. Okay, so there's an example of it. And I pulled the next slide, slide number 10, um, off of the Cult of Pedagogy website, which, which is brilliant. Um, this is in the resources at the end. It's a brilliant resource for pedagogy. Jennifer Gonzalez uses the example of food. And I'm flipping here to food because I want you to see another example, but I don't want to privilege anyone's content. So we're going to, unless you, someone here teaches health and fitness and nutrition. Um, the success criteria is in the center. And you can see that it has been categorized. So some of you said, wow, I really like that there's a category so that I can break these big learning outcomes into pieces you are noticing. And, and I want you to see here that you can actually name those categories like Jennifer Gonzalez has done with food, presentation, and comfort. So you can maintain those categories. Um, slide 11 gives you a little bit of an anatomy about how to write this. So I'm starting in the center where it says in the hot pink box on slide 11, do this box first, okay? You'll write the success criteria for your learning outcome. And I'm here to tell you when I started doing this, I'm like, oh, I don't know what success looks like. Like I had, I had to work to define to, to define it so clearly that, that I could see my student work in it. I had to take away the big words. I had to take away the adjectives because it made things subjective. I had to add objective things like two examples of, or we'll name three of the five, right? I had to really do a lot of work just to get my success criteria dialed in. Once I have it, that goes in the center box. What will the student know and be able to do to demonstrate proficiency as specifically and clearly and objectively as possible? And then I go to the second box, which is to figure out what the gap is between where a student might be and where their work is proficient. And you are all gonna be brilliant at this because you're experts at your content. And when you're an expert at your content, you can predict the misconceptions that students are going to make. You can pre predict where they are going to be in their emerging development because you're experts in your content. So this is where you'll really draw on your content expertise and the misconceptions that you know that students make so that you can name them in, in this category. And then the last one on the far right, what specific practices or knowledges are moving beyond what proficiency looks like? What is the student doing that is proficient yet fancy or special or advanced or synthesis or analysis or judgment or evaluation or those other high level words? There is an example of what this might look like when it's used on slide 12. And I'm gonna let you look at that for just a minute. Slide 13 is another place to wonder and have questions. So I'm mean, gonna give us a couple of minutes to let you chew on the single point rubric, look at that example, and then um, populate the slide on slide 13 with some thoughts and questions.
It'll take an, about another minute or so, and then I'm gonna address some of these questions. Good questions. I wish I could teach a session on standards-based grading because this is a little tiny little, well, I teach, I do teach on it, but it's an entire course in the summer. This is a tiny little slice of standards-based or specifications-based grading. So your questions make me go, ah, oh, we need a big picture. These are great. Okay, I'm gonna address a few of the questions and then if you have more, unmute. Unmute and say them or um, type them in the chat. Um, so I'll go to the ones that are easiest to an answer first. The, the proficiency scale is, a, is different than the single point rubric. Um, and I use them in, in, in different ways during at different times. I generally use the proficiency scale more for the formative feedback cycle when I want to keep a conversation going about how a student is moving toward proficient. Um, I like to use it with students, you know, they, they see the assessment or the assignment or the target or the, the activity, um, and then they see the scale. And so they know what proficient looks like and it gives them a really clear target. And then I like to use it in a peer feedback cycle and a self-reflection cycle um, because it just gives me an iterative notion of where they are along hitting the proficiency. You know, it, it, learning takes practice, right? <laughs> uh, you know, the first time you changed flat tire, it, it took six hours. <laughs> the second time it took four hours, the third time, right? Anything that we do takes practice um, and, until it becomes automatic and we can retrieve it um, and we need opportunities to retrieve. So the proficiency scale is really great for practice, for in-class practice, when, when we know we're asking students to do something for the first time and, and we're in the practice cycle. Um, I use the one point rubric more in a summative space when I want still the feedback to be the most important thing rather, rather than the grade, the, the grade, which we'll get to next. So, you, they are different because one shows a continuum and where a student is on the continuum um, in a little different way. You are naming what it might look like to be proficient against the learning outcome. And on the single point rubric, you're noting what the student has done against it. So the, the artistry of you as, a, as an instructor, you really have to kind of pick and choose which one to use where, but what they both have in common, which is the most important thing is that they're both based on success criteria and they're both based on proficiency. Um, that language never changes. We never change what it looks like to be successful against a learning outcome. Um, so there's an answer to that one. Um, a lot of you are asking about what do we do with this in an LMS? What do we do with this as a grade? This is squishy and messy and I'm stirring a can of worms, but I, I will tell you what I do because my own expertise is just based on my practice. Everyone else's practice is different. I teach in teacher preparation, um, which means that I get to cutting edge pilot everything that is right. In, in higher education, it's, it's cutting edge. And in K-12, they've been doing this for years. For decades, teachers in elementary education have been using proficiency scales for decades. Um, it's starting to move now with the work of Tom Shimmer and Robert Marzano and other, other specialists. It's starting to move into secondary and it's just starting to dabble um, into higher education. But it feels like a pilot sort of space. Um, because I'm teaching teachers how to teach and I'm the gatekeeper in the courses that I teach, the students are gonna go to the field. I require proficiency. You don't pass unless you're proficient. There's no, you, you, it, it just works for me. Um, I, I had a, a really big aha moment a few years ago when I was tired of grade grubbers. I was tired of students um, being forced, be, being focused on the grade instead of on the learning process. And I just threw it all up in the air in the paradigm and, and shifted the whole thing. Um, students were very upset about that at first because they are schooled in a society that privileges the grade. Um, and I went, oh, well, because I was a little bit of a rebel and I was in teacher prep so I could take some risks. Um, I, I don't give a grade at all 
until I have to. So uh, students have one point for every proficiency in my class. So if I have seven learning outcomes, um, and seven like major assessments, there are seven points. And then there's lots and lots and lots of feedback. They don't get that point until they're proficient. And it's a mastery culture. So they get feedback, they try again. They get feedback, they work with a partner. They get feedback. And, and I'm in teacher prep, so I can do that. I can say, you're gonna go be in charge of humans. You must be proficient on these things, right? But you all feel that way about your discipline. You're like, you're gonna go out and build a scaffold. You have to be proficient. You're going to go out and put a shot in someone's arm. You have to be proficient. So mine is 100% proficiency with a, a full mastery culture. You have every point you get in it. You, I, I shift that to an A. And it's hard um, and it's rigorous, um, but it's student focused. I, I feel like my students have a really hard time with it at first because they've been schooled in a different system. And once they get used to it, what they've told me is they feel they feel comfortable to make a mistake. They feel comfortable to make risks. They feel as if their focus is on mastery and their focus is on learning because the culture of the course changes toward that. I don't even have conversations about points. I don't have to. It's all about learning. It's all focused on learning. And when I say to them, I'm going to help you master this. No one, no one is behind. You get as many chances at this as, as you'd like. Um, I have found for the most part, there are outliers. I have found for the most part that they come to the task. And when I say proficiency will equal an A in the LMS, because that's all the LMS will let me do, they go, oh, that's a good trade. <laughs> yeah, that's a really good trade. Um, so there are lots of schools of thought on that. Um, everyone is in a different place on that. That's a, that's a radical way of looking at the paradigm, but it works in my discipline because I, I teach teachers how to, how to teach. Um, and I, I have to model what best practice is for them in the classroom. So it gets a little squishy with other content areas. And I, those are conversations I'm happy, happy to have um, with folks. Um, and yes, I would provide additional feedback if they are proficient, because we, we, we teach to all levels of learners and our, our students come to us with different needs. Some come in and are proficient just like that. That doesn't mean they stop learning. See, again, when you use a scale, you can privilege the learning and then you can create another place for them to go once they hit proficiency. Um, that's not, again, about a grade, it, it, it's about the learning. So um, I'm gonna check the chat. Ooh, I can't read all of that now, but I'm going to in a minute because it looks like some brilliant things are happening there. Um, I have one minute left, I think, according to the schedule. Um, so what I wanna share is just that this has, helped me focus more on the student and on their learning than taking time to decide what a grade is because things are clear. Um, I, give, I give voice feedback. So I record onto Vocaroo, which is in the resources. Um, and it really allows me a lot of time to focus on being creative and flexible rather than on grading. So here's what I've left for you. Um, in slide 15, it's just a simple little template. If you wanna grab that and try it, remember to start with the pink level. Um, you can make a copy of that and play around with it a little bit. Um, if there are things you want me to follow up with you on, if you want, I have more resources than is even makes sense. And I'm happy to share some of those. So um, if you wanna put your contact information in the parking lot, um, I picked the top resources for you that I use and that I use um, with faculty at Boise State in slide 17. So, please browse and go shopping um, in those. And then my contact information um, and the website that I've been building with, with blog posts and podcasts um, are in slide 18. Oh, 35 minutes is fast. And I wanted to talk to you for 15 more. Someone, someone, tell, someone tell Travis. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, I ended on time. You did a long time. You did great. Years of teaching middle school, I think. <laughs> okay, so any additional resources that you do want to post that you don't want to just send out individually, you can put on the events, this event, and you can just make a comment on it. I already moved over your slides over there, so you don't have to worry about that. But if there's anything additional thank that you, you want to put over there, you can. Well, we want to thank you 
for presenting at the T4L conference. And if anyone has any additional questions, please feel free to get on the Mighty Networks and start a conversation with Serena, even, even either privately or within the event so that we can all see what's happening there. Thank you guys for coming and I'll see you at the next session. Thanks everyone. Sorry, it was so fast and crazy. I appreciate you. your time. You can stop recording, Serena.